we want to welcome you to Charlotte Wildlife Stewards November program. Uh, we got a really great speaker in store for you tonight. And we are the Charlotte chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, one of 19 chapters in the state. And I understand there's a new chapter being formed. So woo woo. Um, we have our website down here, charlottewildlife.org. You can find lots of information about us on there. Our, sorry, our email is down there. If you have questions, comments, program suggestions, we welcome any type of input like that. That would really help us. And of course, you can find us on social media, Facebook and Instagram. That's a great place to go to find what we have going on. And we also have a YouTube channel that has our recorded programs on it, and other great videos. So our mission is to create, protect, and preserve wildlife habitat through education, engagement, and enjoyment. So tonight's one of the education pieces, and you're going to learn a lot of really cool stuff. And this, these photographs, they, they're just a good illustration of some of the things that we do outside. We, you know, we love to be outside, and we want to get you involved and get you outside too. So what we really focus on is creating wildlife habitat. And, you know, we talk about this every time because that's, it's what we need. We lose so much of it to development, so much is being paved over. We need to do what we can to, to, uh, to create it in our own property is preserve what's out there. So the first thing we're gonna need is food. Everybody needs food. You need food, I need food, wildlife needs food. And you can see in this, this photo is a great example because you can see over here on the far right, there's a tube feeder and then this Rebecca down here that provides nectar. And also in the fall, birds will eat, come and eat the seeds. So that's a, a nice native plant choice. All living things need water. Whether you um, have a, a natural water source on your property or you need to add something like a bird bath there are lots of options to do that they also need shelter and places to raise their young and those go hand in hand because that involves things like shrubbery trees you can also add bird houses you can add owl, uh, owl houses bat houses other types of structures like that and then last we're looking for sustainable practices primarily no pesticides. You wanna let the, the insects, the other invertebrates out there kind of take care of balancing that out. Insects and invertebrates are a primary source of food for birds. So if you want birds in your yard, you need insects. And you know, of course we wanna mention that they're great pollinators. You also do things like get a rain barrel, capture that rain that comes off your roof and then use that when you're watering in your garden. So here's a, uh, this picture was in um, one of the previous slides. This was one of our volunteer events. We, uh, in partnership with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, we put up bird houses at the Chantilly Ecological Preserve. That was a really nice day because it, you just feel like you really accomplished a lot when you did that. And I, I had gone back later in the summer and checked and there were nests in those boxes. So we're really looking forward to a really productive spring. And I guess what I want to say with this too is we're building a volunteer base and there's, so what we want is people that if they're available and if whatever it is we're doing is in their interest, that they would sign up to come out and volunteer with us for that event. And if, if you're interested in doing that, you can go to our email, charlottewildlifestewards at gmail.com you know, just shoot us an email, tell us that. Um, there's no obligation, you know, if you're not available, if you're not interested, that's fine. You know, you don't have to do that particular event, but there may be other things coming up that you might want to join us in. And this, this is one of the projects that we're currently working on. I know it doesn't look like much. There's a lot of mud and I will vouch there was a lot of mud. So this is called a littoral shell. It's a little bit of your education for today. And what that is, it's that's that area between the pond and the bank. And it stays pretty moist down there all along the, uh, the, edge, of the, the edge of the pond. It was really muddy. And we partnered with Stormwater to put in the, the plants along there. That, that's going to eventually, probably in about two years, that's going to be very lush with things like bulrushes and pickerel weed. 
flag iris. There are three bald cypress trees put in there. Some, let me see, what's the other button bush and beautyberry. So this is part of the grant. Ernie had talked about our grant at our last program and so from the North Carolina Native Plant Society. And mm -hmm. this is what some of that grant money is going toward. Well, this is all that the grant money is going toward actually. So that's gonna be a really nice addition to the Chantilly Ecological Sanctuary. Uh, we're winding down just a little bit as we're moving into the uh, winter months. But at the end of this month, November 21st, we're having an I Spy Nature Walk. And that's an event, it's for all ages actually, whether you've got little kids, whether you're young, you know, young singles, whatever, doesn't matter what age you are, or even if you're retired, we love to go on these nature walks and just explore what's out there. Um, even in the fall, there's a lot going on out in the woods. And we'll be at Stevens Creek Nature Preserve on the 21st at three o'clock. So I hope to see you there. Um, there's no need to register, just come, come as you are. And then we don't have an educational online program in December, we take a break. But rest assured that we'll be, we'll still have our leadership team meeting, we'll still be planning for things coming up in 2022. In our first program, which will be on January 7th at 7 p.m., will still be an online program because our presenter, Steve Goodman, is in Asheville. And he'll be joining us and talking to us about wildlife corridors. So we all know what those problems are. And I'm sure Marvin will touch on that tonight about, you know, where we have the roads. Uh, I saw a meme that said, this isn't a deer crossing the road. This is a road crossing the forest. So that's you know an interesting or an important topic that we need to address. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn this over oops, to Ernie so he can introduce our speaker for tonight. All right, thank you, Donna. Uh, greetings, everybody, and we're very thankful that uh, you set time aside tonight to join us for this special presentation. Uh, Marvin Boat Night goes back a long ways with our chapter. And we're very lucky to have him share some of his knowledge with us tonight. Marvin is a native South Carolinian and a graduate of Clemson University in the wildlife and fisheries biology area. He spent over 30 years as a wildlife biologist and naturalist in both private and public organizations throughout both Carolinas. In addition to providing educational and interpretive programs about flora and fauna of the Southeast. He also worked as an interpretive trails and exhibit designer, consultant for museums, nature centers, and environmental education centers. Currently, Marvin works for the Catawba Nation to help manage their tribe's natural resources. He's an exceptional photographer. He's an author, a beekeeper, a birder, a fly fisherman, certified mushroom forager, and more, keeping him quite busy. His wife and he, his wife's name is Gabriella, host a program called Walk on the Wild Side. It's a fun and educational bi-monthly podcast that explores the beauty and diversity of wildlife all around us. And I'll get Marvin to tell you more about that, but it's on most major podcast platforms. Marvin, again, as I said, is a longtime friend and partner and supporter of the Charlotte Wildlife Stewards. And so with that, we welcome him and thank you again, Marvin, for spending your evening with us. Go ahead. Absolutely, thank you, Ernie. Um, Don, I thought for the life of me, you said birdhouses. I swear I thought I heard you say outhouses and I was thinking, boy, I've been doing this all wrong my entire career. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I didn't say outhouses. <laughs> uh, you know, outhouses do attract some things, but uh, probably not yeah. what we want in our backyards. Spiders. Uh, hey guys, my name is Marvin Baldwin. I'm a, yeah, a lot of black widows. Um, my name is Marvin Baldwin. I'm a naturalist and wildlife biologist. And uh, boy, I tell you what, talk about closely aligned um, goals, you know, being a naturalist and wildlife biologist and then getting the, uh, the honor and the pleasure of being able to present uh, with Charlotte Wildlife Stewards is is pretty awesome. So I appreciate the opportunity, Ernie and Donna. Thank you all for giving me that opportunity. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about 
I call it suburban and urban wildlife and uh, and kind of the challenges that we have dealing with our, our urban and suburban wildlife. We're going to talk a little bit about kind of what's going on and what's causing the issue. And then we'll talk about some of the species that you'll see. Just FYI, I tried to shy away from birds that much because, boy, there are a ton of birds that really kind of benefit from the feeding and things that we do in our backyard. So I try to concentrate mostly on more, I would say, almost charismatic megafauna, if you will. Uh, so we'll look at them. But if you guys have questions about birds at the end of the presentation, please, please ask. I'll be more than happy to answer those. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And we'll start the program. So we're going to talk about the uh, suburban sprawl and the wildlife within, animals in and around our neighborhoods. So um, I guess it's no, it's no surprise the sprawl we're talking about, of course, is Charlotte. Um, for our presentation tonight. There's many cities, but have you ever wondered why these cities pop up where they pop up? And I think that's important to kind of start and talk about because you know what? We live in the Piedmont, don't we? Uh, we live in the Piedmont of North and South Carolina. I live in the Piedmont of South Carolina down here in Chester. And of course, you guys up there live in the Piedmont. If you've ever thought about it, really a lot of our large cities in the Southeast are formed along the Piedmont. And why is that? Well, it's because it's a transition from basically, you know, that area that's the Blue Ridge, Blue Ridge Escarpment, the mountains that we have, all the way down to the coastal plains. Many people settled in the middle, uh, which would be here in the Piedmont. You know, first and foremost, the Native Americans, the indigenous people and in the tribes, which one I work with now with Catawba Nation, um, they they all formed here and were the indigenous people in this area. And they actually had roots between themselves. They had trade routes. They had travel routes and stuff. And those were all along the Piedmont, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner. Those eventually turned into other pathways. When the Europeans came, of course, there was a great wagon road that was developed, but there were trade routes with the Europeans. And they also followed along that fall line with the Piedmont as they went up. And then once the Europeans came, the Europeans dispersed throughout the Southeast. And you can see some came from uh, Philadelphia. They came, you see the Germans, the Scot-Irish, the Scotch Highlanders, I mean, the Swiss, the French, everyone came in. And they all had a tendency to migrate and push toward the Piedmont because of the, the wonderful soils, the, the rapid rivers, but the not, uh, not high elevations that made it difficult for travel. So the Piedmont proved very popular at that point. And of course, here today, it is extremely popular with folks. In fact, we know that if you look along the Southeast, there's some emerging uh, megapolises, they call them, um, which are the Southern uh, Maloc uh, Me Megalopolis, I guess, Megapolis. It's eventually gonna be Atlanta, Greenville, Spartanburg, Charlotte, Raleigh. That's all just gonna be one big, huge area. And you see that up in the Northeast as well. That's the kind of pressure that's going to be put upon us in the area that we live in now. Look at that. The red areas that you see are urban areas, and the green that you see in this is all the Piedmont location. Look at that concentration, and look at the, the spread of that green from the center of those cities, specifically Atlanta and Charlotte and Raleigh. Look at that. Look at that spread. So that's what we refer to as the urban and suburban sprawl. Okay, here's another good photograph to show you guys a little diagram just to show you based on population per square mile. And you can see the densities all up and down the eastern seaboard. And guess what, guys, where you're seeing all those clusters, that's pretty much the Piedmont. Okay, that's our area. So we are forced with a situation of dealing with a, a huge increase, even more than we're seeing now of our population, people moving to the Southeast. In fact, uh, probably since 1972 to, to 2020, the population has doubled in our area, believe it or not. That's just a lot of people. And where people come, people demand homes. They, they demand roads. They demand shopping, food, everything like that. Well, this is what Charlotte used to look like. And it was already starting to become, you know, a pretty good sized city at that point. But here we are today, and, and look at that diagram just for a second. I want you guys to take a peek at that. Look at the sprawl 
that is kind of spread out from the city itself. And as the city continues to grow, demands for housing within the city and then demands for housing outside of the city, i.e. suburbia, increases. So here's a few little points for you guys to know. We've lost 24 million acres of wild land in the last 16 years. Like I said, the southeastern population has doubled from 1970 to 2020. And, and a lot of folks don't realize that, that development is a, is a progression. It goes from wildlands to a lot of times agricultural and farmlands. Um, these forested areas are cleared for agriculture, cleared for production of food in the form of crops as well as cattle. And then suburbia kind of develops and then also it develops into cities and eventually becomes an urban environment. So what we're seeing eventually was a progression from forested habitat to neighborhoods that eventually sprung into become cities. Now that those cities are there, we're seeing it even continue to sprawl out to accommodate the number of people that want to be around that city that work and live within a city. So it's almost like a circular situation is happening. And it happens kind of slowly at first. I mean, I'm living here in Chester, South Carolina, you know, and it's it's small. At one time, it was burgeoning. But, you know, with the loss of textiles, with loss of factories and things like that, it kind of went through a depression. And now it's kind of starting to come back up. And we're starting to see property values increase. We're starting to see more people from the Charlotte area, from the Rock Hill area, move into our area. So we're starting to see that spread as well. So it can happen slowly. But boy, once it starts, it happens pretty quickly. So I want to see if we can play this video here. I'm not sure if it's going to play or not. Well, it's not going to play. So let's look at the, uh, this is actually a view. You can go online on YouTube and you can see this will actually show the sprawl from 2009. Let's see if it's going to come up here. 2009 to 2016. Check this out. Let's see what it is. There you go. That's the development of suburbia. Okay. That's what happened. That's what's happened to our wild spaces. This will show you a little bit better for Charlotte Mecklenburg. Okay. 1976, the yellow indicates basically population and it indicates acreage that has been turned from forest areas into basically a residential, commercial, things like that. So 1976, 1996, 2006, and in 2020, last year, 70% of Mecklenburg County has become non forest Okay. In 1976, 87% was really considered to be forested. And now, in 2020, 76%, and here's the projection for 2030, 97% of Mecklenburg County will be developed. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty scary thought. Um, you know, I hate to be Debbie Downer here, but that's, that's a pretty um, difficult thing. And we all think about what are we going to do with all these people? Well, what in the world is wildlife going to do with the impacts of all this building? with all this loss of habitat, with all this loss of the many things that they need to survive. I mean, that is that is a concrete jungle. Look at that. And you know what? Charlotte is actually more forested. It has more tree canopy than many cities across the United States. You know, can you imagine all the other ones that don't have nearly the tree canopy that Charlotte has? So that tells me that there's a, there's a glimmer of hope for the future with you know, groups like Charlotte Wildlife Stewards and folks like you who are interested in wildlife to try and protect this wildlife, to try and, and, and create havens for wildlife. I mean, this is a typical urban environment in Charlotte, okay? But the scary thing about it for me is this is a typical suburban environment. And the one thing that jumps out to me about this picture is not just the density of homes, but it's the just sheer amount of grass. You know, and grass is just that monocultural desert for wildlife. And so that's the challenges that we all have because, hey, there's wildlife here and this wildlife is trying to adapt to our presence and we can do a lot to make it easier on them and to also maintain some semblance of wildness, some semblance of our connection with nature instead of having it become just a concrete jungle where the only wildlife you're going to see is, you know, cockroaches and things like that. And we'll talk a little more about that. And you see something like this and you say, well, that that's not happening around here. This is a Charlotte development. Okay. This is a photograph of a Charlotte development. So yes, this, this is happening. 
one of the things that we hope that folks like Charlotte uh, Wildlife Stewards and other groups can do is educate developers on how to make sustainable and wildlife friendly yards and friendly neighborhoods. You know, we talk about those corridors, but if you look at what we're looking at right here in this picture, the one thing that jumps out to me is the term habitat fragmentation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about more here in just a little bit, but that's a big issue, um, you know, that we have to deal with with these developments. So what happens to the wildlife? Well, you know what, when we move into an area, some, some wildlife, they just cannot adapt to our presence and they disappear. You know, you see these animals are unable to, to survive around us. They're unable to survive and make adaptations to really what amounts to be very quick changes. You know, I, I always tell somebody, you talk about a white-tailed deer and they step out in the road and, and people look at it and they say, well, gosh, why don't you just step back out of the way of the car? And, and you know what? For them to be able to adapt to the speed of vehicles and to be able to understand what crossing the road means takes a long time and sometimes they may not adapt. Also, the type of vision that they have doesn't allow them to gauge depth. So there's a lot of issues they have with their inability to adapt to crossing roads. So we have to make the accommodations. We're the ones who have to know this and make those changes. So what happens to the wildlife? Well, like I said, some can't adapt and they disappear, okay? What about this guy? This is a typical example of something that, that basically was hunted to extinction and well, properties were developed to the point where they could no longer, this is the Eastern Cougar. And the Eastern Cougar, no matter what you hear, stories uh, in the paper and stuff like that, the Eastern Cougar itself was extirpated from our area from loss of habitat and hunting um, and was gone. Now, are we starting to see the Western Cougar spread our way a little bit? Absolutely. But the absolute um, existence of the Eastern Cougar in, in the Southeast United States is gone. You know, maybe there's some pets that have gotten out. Maybe there's some animals that have escaped from roadside menageries that were so popular back in, in the 60s and 50s. Um, but, you know, I say that with conviction because I know some people are going to argue with me that they've seen uh, panthers and things like that. So, you know, there's other explanations for some of those, and that's not the forum to, uh, to get into to argue about that. But we do know that species-wise, we found feces, uh, droppings, scat, um, from panthers and mountain lions in as close as Tennessee, and the genetics have shown that they're actually from South and North Dakota. So this used to be the cat that was the most wide-ranging cat in the world. It extended in the Americas, not just South America and North America, all the Americas, Central America, and now because of habitat fragmentation, because of hunting, because of uh, genetic isolation, we have a small little population down in Florida and everything else is west and south. And now we're starting to see some of those actually come back and there's reasons for those changes. And a lot of it has to do with the appetite for hunting these animals and people and the movement toward wanting to protect more wildlife than to extirpate it. So that's kind of a positive. What are some other animals that have just completely disappeared due to loss of habitat and the presence of people? How about the ivory bill woodpecker? Boy, the ivory bill woodpecker, that's still an animal a lot of people say they think they've seen. And some folks think they've seen a population in Arkansas. Man, I would cross my fingers and hope for that. But the fact is pretty much the last sighting in the United States that was, that was completely documented was around, I think, in the 40s in Louisiana. And I think 1986, they actually um, documented ivory bill woodpeckers in Cuba. Um, but in terms of Right now, they've made a decision to remove the ivory bill woodpecker from being endangered to going and putting it on the extinction list. And that's a sad day for, for all of us. That's a beautiful bird of the uh, bottomland old growth forests that were logged extensively and its habitat was depleted. Uh, one thing that's near and dear to a lot of us here in North, Car you know, North Carolina folks and me in South Carolina, I'll have to say, it, is the red wolf. You know, and that that population has dwindled, and you guys are probably looking at the rarest mammal in the world, or one of them. Um, and again, hunting, which kind of relates to the presence of people, and also lack of tolerance for them being around farms, um, agricultural areas, and things like that, and loss of habitat as well. 
So losing, losing that animal and probably just seeing the, the tail end of, of losing them for good. I hope not. I hope we can bring them back, but it is really not looking good for that critter at this point. And what a beautiful, majestic animal to see. Um, Bachman's warbler is pretty much going to be declared extinct now because they haven't seen them in quite some time. Uh, they were actually really, um, really dependent upon cane breaks. And there used to be cane breaks all throughout the Southeast. The cane breaks were actually, we've lost about 98% of our cane breaks. They used to talk about cane breaks being six miles wide. You'd have to walk around them because they were impenetrable. Um, but these animals nested and depended upon cane breaks quite a bit. Uh, and they've lost them. Cane breaks are actually a focus of attention from Catawba Nation as well as other southeastern tribes because there's very little um, large stands of, of river cane, which is Arundinaria gigantea. Um, it was used for cultural purposes such as basketry, also blowguns, tools, things like that. And uh, in order to continue those cultural practices and pass those down uh, from from generation to generation in those tribes, um, we're trying to restore those, those cane breaks. But unfortunately, we may be able to restore those cane breaks, but we're not gonna be able to restore birds and other wildlife there that were dependent upon them, but now are extinct. Like, of course, the passenger pigeon, which also depended upon cane breaks and also Bachman's warbler here. So some wildlife are, is beginning to disappear and we're starting to see them disappear. When's the last time you guys heard a whippoorwill or a chuckwill's widow or saw nighthawks flying around lights catching insects? Uh, the encroachment of people, the loss of habitat is really affecting these birds, which are ground nesters. And unfortunately, um, we are really starting to see those folks disappear. Now, I live out in the country out here in Chester, and I'm extremely fortunate to have both chuckwills, widowed, and whippoorwills nesting in our yard. So we hear them every summer. Um, but you know what? It's one of those things that there are folks who live in Charlotte that can remember hearing whippoorwills and chuckwills, widows. And, and now they don't hear them. But the more scary fact is there's a lot of people living in Charlotte who've never heard them. So you don't know what you're missing if you've never heard it. That's again why education is so extremely important to talk about. These animals are, st are still here. We can still provide habitat for them and hopefully they won't leave, but they cannot adapt to the presence of people. They need certain habitat. They need ecotones, which are where two habitats meet. And if we don't have those ecotones, we don't have that edge uh, in between habitats, we're gonna lose these birds for good. So that's why it's extremely important to set aside habitat and, and quality habitat. All the parks, the county parks in Mecklenburg, uh, you guys have a jewel up in Mecklenburg and embrace that as much as you can, support them as much as you can. Uh, I know Charlotte Wildlife Stewards has a great partnership with Mecklenburg County Parks and providing educational programs there as well. But guys, uh, the work they're doing and the amount of land that they're trying to preserve in Mecklenburg County is probably one of the most important things that they do. So please support them and you'll continue to see beautiful birds like this whippoorwill right here. So, you know, we're also starting to see bats disappear and bats can adapt uh, to, we put up bat houses, but we still gotta have open areas. You know, in these heavily um, concentrated suburban neighborhoods, bats are struggling to find places to live and rear their young. They're struggling to find food because all these houses have mosquito misting systems or they spray pesticides. All that is affecting them to be able to find fresh water, shelter, and food. And if they can't find those, the very least that can happen is they move out into other areas. But the worst that can happen is they just completely disappear. We still see bats from time to time. And you know what? There's still a lot of things we can do to encourage bats. Again, I hate to keep tooting the horn of uh, Charlotte Wildlife Stewards, but education, um, volunteer programs to put up bat houses in certain habitats and stuff is extremely important because you know what? We could do away with a lot of this pesticide spraying and encourage bats to come in, as well as those chuck wheels and those whipper wheels. And, uh, and we could have our own mosquito control in the form of our biological cousins. So I think that would be something we would want to do. But yes, we are seeing bats continue to decline.
And one of the ones that has pretty much disappeared from a lot of the areas due to uh, urbanization and suburbanization. And I've heard it so many times, people tell me, what has happened to our lightning bugs? And, and there's, it's a multifaceted approach. First and foremost, it's loss of habitat. One of the big things around suburban and urban neighborhoods is a green, plain, white, uh, plain lawn is more beautiful to people than one that's covered in leaves. And unfortunately, these, these insects lay their eggs in that leaf litter. And so when we rake all that up and remove that, we're not only removing nutrients from the soil and nutrients from the trees, we're also removing habitat and a lot of times eggs and larvae uh, from, the, from these animals and stuff. And so coupling that with the, the amount of light and the light pollution that we have, we've made it almost impossible for lightning bugs to survive in our area. You can go to some dark areas and see them still, but I'm gonna tell you what, uh, we have stopped using, well, we never started using any pesticides and fertilizers here on our lawn, and we've got about 10 acres out here. And in the past three years that we've lived here, we've seen the population of lightning bugs at our house here double. So it is uh, spectacular to see it. We love seeing lightning bugs. And you know what? We can still make changes ourselves to allow these lightning bugs to come back because they're not completely gone. But boy, we are really well on our way to making sure that children don't grow up seeing lightning bugs in their backyard, and that is extremely sad. So other wildlife, some wildlife can tolerate a human presence, but it's the stress that we put on them, right? It's the encounters we have with them. It's the, it's the stuff we do in our yards that really, the more we develop and the progression toward more urban environments leads to the demise of these animals. You may see them, and you may see them in the suburban life, but you may not see them soon if we continue to develop their habitat, develop the areas that they can retreat to, and develop the areas that allow them to travel to these locations. Um, Donna was talking about wildlife corridors. They're extremely important because we fragmented the habitat for a lot of these animals. And you know what? Crossing the road may seem easy for us, but it is difficult to deadly for all of our wildlife. And so we need to come up with solutions to be able to allow wildlife to move from these fragmented habitats and create a wildlife corridor. And there is some master planning that can be done and it's being done and I'm tickled to see it. Crescent Resources is doing a great job of incorporating wildlife corridors, but it needs to become a more widespread practice. And, and it's not happening because density equals dollars. And we need to really kind of get away from that attitude. So what kind of animals are we talking about? Well, white-tailed deer. You know, some people will look at white-tailed deer and say, you know what? They've pretty much adapted to our, to our uh, habitat. They've adapted to the presence of humans. So they're not going anywhere. But you know what, guys? As we go more from away from suburban type developments, which has green spaces in it, and we move more toward a tightly packed urban environment with no green spaces, deer aren't gonna be around. They can't eat concrete, they can't eat asphalt. So they're eventually gonna to get to a point where they're gonna be pushed out to the point that they cannot thrive or survive in our environments. And so that's why wildlife spaces, green spaces, and, and basically taking your yard and turning it into a wildlife habitat is so extremely important for animals like white-tailed deer. Other animals? Wild turkey. Wild turkey have surprisingly tolerated um, the presence of people. Now, we extirpated, most people don't realize, we extirpated the turkeys from our environment, and thanks to the Wild Turkey Federation, uh, they were able to reestablish turkeys in the area. Now, you know, you hear people in suburban neighborhoods, they have turkeys in their backyard, uh, and they've adapted pretty well to being able to feed in these yards, but once again, as we move away from green spaces, animals like this disappear. And again, extremely important to think about the needs of wildlife that exist if we want to continue to see them. And I don't know about you, I, I just, I feel that message is the message we just really need to keep pushing is, you know, we need to foster that appreciation. We need to encourage curiosity about these animals because that's what saves them. Steve Irwin so famously said, humans protect animals that they like and they protect things they love. So we need to foster that love and that appreciation for this wildlife.
And hopefully, you know, we'll always be able to see animals like this in the wild and not in zoos and not in photographs. Okay, so this may be one that you might be saying, glad that they're not gonna be around, but I, I love skunks myself, but skunks have adapted very well to human presence, okay? They've adapted to being able to live under sheds and things like that and feed on grubs and stuff like that found. They also can dig through trash cans. They've adapted very well. Again, once we do away with places where they can safely den up, uh, where they can safely find food and stuff, they'll also eventually disappear as well. So all these animals at our current state that I'm showing you have pretty much adapted to the presence of humans, um, not to the point where they're overly thriving, but they're tolerating the presence of humans, okay? How many of you have seen a red fox run through your backyard? Red foxes have adapted pretty well to the presence of people. And this goes back a ways because really the red fox is the, the one of our two species of foxes out of the two, the red foxes adapt to people. They love to hang around agricultural areas, farms. I mean, who's not heard of a fox in the hen house? Um, but they've adapted where to uh, very well to agricultural areas, um, farms, and the presence of people. And now they've adapted to be able to, you know, take advantage of small pockets of green space, of, uh, of protected forested areas, and they can den in those areas and raise babies and, and actually function quite well. So red foxes are one that they're very secretive and, uh, and you know, you can see them out. They, they adapt and get used to people pretty well. However, um, they can also pose a little bit of a problem because they can be a vector for things like uh, rabies, distemper, parvo, mange, and stuff like that. So as well as the gray fox. Now the gray fox is a lot more shy than the red fox, but you will still see them, especially if you live in an area surrounded by uh, let's just say some forested parks because the gray fox actually adapts to that very well. Some of them will actually climb up and den in trees. Yep, that's right. A dog that can climb. He actually has an extra long claws, got a little ridge in the pad of his feet, uh, and he can articulate his wrist. And those allow him to be able to climb trees actually well enough to be able to eat persimmons and things like that out of the trees. So, you know, you may see a, a fox in a tree. And if you do, 99% of the time, it's going to be a gray fox but they really rely on trees and fruiting trees and things like that. So having cover and having food is very important for the gray fox. And we, we can, with careful planning, provide this. And of course, probably the one that we just are not seeing that often, and it's two reasons why we're not seeing them. One, this cat, the bobcat, is extremely secretive and extremely nocturnal. He only is seen when he wants to be seen. Um, so does that mean there's not bobcats in our suburban environment? It does not mean there's not, but this one is extremely sensitive to the presence of people and the more interactions and altercations they have with people, then the less you're going to be seeing them. And this is one that if they're forced into being around people, really stress affects them. It affects the coat that they have. It affects their, uh, health. It affects their weight. It affects everything. And eventually, these animals, they just cannot survive around people for that extended period of time, and they really can't adapt to being around people. So that's one that we're going to see probably disappear, if not already, from the Mecklenburg-Charlotte area with maybe just a few pockets in parks and stuff like that. So, And, of course, you know, we always see some black bears. Black bears, of course, uh, if they have surrounding areas where they can retreat to, They'll come into the city and come into the, the suburban areas quite often. Bears range quite a bit. They do a behavior called ambling where they walk and they swing their head trying to pick up smells and familiarity. And, you know, they used to cross Mecklenburg County before there were a lot of places in Mecklenburg County. And a lot of them still will ramble and amble along these areas. And so you'll see them as they get dispersed from their territories and habitats by larger males, and as their population grows, they come into more uh, altercations with people. But the, the black bear is not going to be something that you're going to be going to see a play at the uh, Blumenthal Theater, and one's going to pop his head up out of the trash can. You may see a glimpse of them here and there, but the more we move from suburban to urban and get rid of the green spaces, this animal will disappear as well. 
One animal that has adapted to people surprisingly well has been the bar down. You guys in, in um, Myers Park and surrounding neighborhoods, Dilworth and places like that, y'all know that the owls are doing quite well in those areas, but there's a key element of those neighborhoods as to why this animal is doing well, and it's the trees. It's the presence of trees and the canopy. And not only is the canopy important for these birds, you see him living in a hollow. So if they don't have dead trees and hollows to nest in, um, there's only so many nest boxes we can put up and you can't put nest boxes up if you don't have trees. So, you know, it's extremely important how you manage the trees around you and on your property. If you've got dead trees or dying trees that are not affecting your home or not affecting your neighbor or not affecting your, your driveway or pathways or anything, leave them. You know, animals need those and that provides valuable habitat. And we'll talk more about that as well but you really, really need to make sure that you leave these places for these owls to nest. Leave the trees up that you can attach the boxes to and nest boxes to, but you know, you can't just put one on a pole in the middle of a parking lot and expect a barred owl to be there. So this is also one that's adapted. Didn't think he would adapt very well, but they surprisingly have adapted. They've adapted to the point where they actually don't feed on the same stuff they feed on in the wild. They've adapted to eating bigger stuff like squirrels and feral cats. So they've done very well uh, with adapting to being around people. Uh, there's some other things that affect them that we can we can do and make changes that can actually uh, ensure that we'll see these gorgeous, beautiful birds. And yes, I will go ahead and do my call. Oh, 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 There you go. That's free with admission, folks. All right. Anybody know what this critter is? This is one that uh, there's arguments. Some people call them synanthropic, which means that they've actually done so well, they're thriving around people. Well, the coyote is extremely adaptable. And coyotes have, they were not introduced into our area. A lot of people say they're a non-native invasive species. I really don't characterize them as that. I characterize them as a native species that is expanding its range. And that's what they've done. And they've moved into these areas and, and mainly because there's a lack of predators. You know, when we lost and are losing the red wolf, uh, they would keep these animals at bay. But now, you know, since there's no other predators or larger mammals to compete with them, they're exploding. And since they're so adaptable, they adapt very well to suburban environments and they're even adapting to urban environments. Um, you can go in uptown Charlotte and you can actually hear coyotes howling. Uh, people have seen them darting back and forth through alleys. So they're adapting pretty well. However, if we eliminate areas that they have for cover, and if we eliminate their foods and stuff, they're going to be hard pressed to survive as well, which is why I don't like to call them a complete synanthropic species, simply because they are wide ranging. They're not necessarily pack runners. They do run in packs sometimes, but they are solitary as well. And of course, where there's cities, there's roads, and that's fragmentation, and eventually that's going to take its toll on this population as well. But boy, I think right now, as we speak, coyotes are here to stay, uh, and they're they're definitely posing some issues, not because they're mean and nasty, but because they're just smart and adaptive and just, you know, there's a reason why the Native Americans call him the trickster. Um, they, are, they are extremely adaptable, so they're going to be around for quite some time. Let's see here. Hang on a second, guys. This is um, taking a little time here. Um, see if I can get it to move here. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but um, with all these animals that we're seeing, of course, there's also things like raccoons, you know, there's also things like the opossum. These animals have adapted so well. In fact, I would say there are some synanthropic species that we talk about. There are animals that have adapted to living around people, and they do so well that they've now become dependent upon us. Think about things like hmm, raccoons, right? Raccoons are doing so well, they're almost dependent upon people. Opossums are dependent upon people. Chimney swifts. Chimney swifts have gotten to a point now that where they used to use cliffs and caves 
and dead trees and, and hollow tree trunks, now they almost exclusively use chimneys. And when you destroy chimneys, you affect their population. So they're really dependent upon humans. Okay, Purple martins have become almost dependent upon humans as well. How about house mice, right? They've adapted to living in our houses. They've adapted to living around us. Another one that really is kind of scary that you think about, the brown rat and also the Norway rats that people call wharf rats. You can see huge populations of rats living in cities and they become dependent upon cities, which is crazy. Those are true synanthropic species. They are dependent upon people and as people go, they go. Think about something like bed bugs. Uh, think about something like German cockroaches. Those are all dependent upon people. And, you know, we've seen when you, when you take a house and you remove the humans from that house, bed bugs die. German cockroaches eventually will die. So they are dependent upon human species. Those are true synanthropic species. Are those the species that we want around us? Probably not, but they are true synanthropic species. The problem is with all of this stuff, if we kind of have reached a uh, homostasis, if you will, and weren't growing anymore, then we can really uh, adopt different methods of coexisting with a lot of these animals. And unfortunately, we're not to the point where we've stopped. We are continuing to grow. And as you can see, you can drive into Uptown Charlotte and look around the skyline and see these cranes everywhere. Charlotte is continuing to grow and continuing to spread out. So that means that we really have to get to a point where we truly do adopt better practices for sustainable development, as well as preserving large tracts of land from development. I think everyone kind of hears people say development threatens wildlife, development threatens wildlife. How does it threaten wildlife though, right? It's more than just the most obvious. It's more than just loss of space. And you know what? Loss of space is huge. I mean, many animals just, they, they simply cannot adapt to a loss of space for shelter, safety, brood rearing, and, and a place to escape, to get away from stresses. The other thing that development does to wildlife is, is it creates barriers to movement. Just like Donna said, the, the habitat fragmentation, the surrounding areas like forested little parks and stuff, surrounding it with development so the animals have no place to go. They have no way to get out of that small, little oasis of habitat. Inability to maintain genetic diversity because their, their movements are restricted. That's what you're seeing with the Florida panther. They can't free range like they used to. They used to cross genetics with mountain lions found in, or panthers found in Louisiana, in Texas. They can no longer get to those areas. So now their population has genetically isolated. That means that they're basically mating with brother, sister, mother, father, and the diversity of genetics has decreased tremendously to a point that you're seeing things like feline leukemia. You're seeing holes in the heart, which are birth defects. You're seeing where the testicles of males are not dropping and developing enough to produce viable sperm. They, pre they predict that in most Florida panthers, only 1% of their sperm is viable. If they had genetic diversity, which means new genetic material coming and going, then that would have eliminated that. But unfortunately, they're facing the same issue that the cheetah is facing in Africa, which is they are pretty much in what we call an extinction vortex because we cannot vary their genetics enough to allow them to be able to adapt and get away from these birth defects that are happening because of the genetic, uh, the lack of diversity. So population isolation leads to a lot of that. And, and we're literally polluting them. You know, we're polluting the water sources, literally choking animals with, with exhaust from cars, exhaust from generators, exhaust from heavy equipment, increased use of pesticides and herbicides. All that is related to human habitation. We're destroying their natural food sources. If you don't believe it, look at your lawn. If you've got a green lawn out there, then chances are you don't have a lot of food for wildlife out there, okay? What did it take to get that green lawn? 
What chemicals did you have to put on that lawn to keep the grubs from eating it? What kind of reverberating effect does that have on wildlife? And, and you guys know the answer. Those are rhetorical questions. Stress is incredibly uh, underrated, I think, pretty much as something that happens. There. We put stress on them. We, we have the stress of interactions. There's a reason why when you go up to a fox, he growls and takes off and runs the other way. Okay, It's stressful for them to come into contact with people. And they have the inability to adapt to the presence of human, especially in tight spaces, which are like our neighborhoods, our backyards, our fenced-in areas. A lot of times, wildlife can get over a fence, but they may not be able to get back over because they're freaking out, because they're stressed, because people have come out. Or our pets, like our dogs, are stressing them out. Light pollution is another one, okay? Light pollution, I just want to ask you guys, what is the most destructive component of urbanization? And the most destructive component is light pollution. You know, and it's more than just the amount of light it creates. Animals, they have low light vision, especially nocturnal animals, are adapted for living and thriving in dark, in dark areas, only using the light of the moon, only using the light of the stars. And when they come into our area, they have a temporary loss of vision due to bright light. I mean, they're retinas. They're, they're animals out there that only have rods. These are animals that see in gray tones, but they have tremendous night vision. You know, they don't have color vision, so they don't have cones. They only have rods. Bright lights, especially lights from cars, lights from buildings, they can actually cause retinas to be damaged permanently in a lot of these animals. Light pollution extremely affects animals that have that night vision and stuff. What else? If you think about it, guys, think about frogs. As soon as it gets dark, right after a rain, the frogs start calling, okay? As soon as the sun starts to set, that, that photo period, that length of day and length of night, if you blur the lines between those two, you affect the physiological aspects of many animals. Like frogs, if they don't know when it gets dark, a lot of times it won't cue them to mate. Okay, It won't cue them to start calling. Some of these animals are so bright outside, they don't know when's light and when's day, uh, when's day, when's night. So, you know, it affects their ability to function. It affects their ability to find mates. Hey, have you ever thought about how the darkness of night can also affect the blooming times of certain flowers? Some flowers are triggered to bloom at night in a lack of light and actually attracts moths to pollinate them, okay? We turn on the lights and stuff like that, and guess what, guys? Uh, a lot of these things don't happen. The light actually changes physiologically the operation of a lot of our wildlife, our flora, and our fauna. Some animals use the cover of darkness to, to help them camouflage themselves, not only to stalk prey, but also to be able to escape predators. Um, you know, they use that coloration. A lot of times they use the advantage of darkness to uh, enhance already pretty good camouflage, right? Uh, you think about some of these animals that, that need darkness because some of them may not have great camouflage. You know, they haven't adapted great camouflage, but they have adapted nocturnal habits in order to exist at night where camouflage is not as important for those guys, okay? So, a lot of times to escape from predators, if there's light out and they can't get away from the light, it makes them extremely vulnerable to predation. Heck, some animals are attracted to light. Okay? We've actually seen red bats adapt to the presence of street lights to be able to fly around where insects are concentrated due to being attracted to light. But a lot of times being attracted to the light makes animals that normally would not be susceptible or vulnerable to predation very vulnerable to predation. So light affects the ability of, of animals to be able to hide with the camouflage. And if they're attracted to the lights, that makes it even worse. And you think about it, predators actually adapt their habitat and their styles to hang out on the edge of light cover and actually stalk animals, you know, as they're exposed by the light. So light does affect hunting and predation as well as making animals that are attracted to light very susceptible. It also affects mating. Lighting affects um, animals like frogs, let's just say, for example. They breed in large number and they use the cover of darkness 
to hide them when they gather in large numbers, and they actually find each other through mating calls. Okay, so auditory calls allow them to find each other in the dark. You imagine all these frogs mating during the day, a field day that predators would have on them, and you can imagine how this would affect the population and continued diversity of frogs. That's just one animal that we talk about with mating. What about my favorite, that whippoorwill, that chuckwill's widow? You know, what about that barred owl that the night coming on triggers them to hoot, uh, as well as great horned owls? But whippoorwills are nocturnal. They have big black eyes. They cannot function in the bright daylight, okay? They really, because of the size of their eyes being adapted for nocturnal uh, hunting, they hunt by the light of the moon. And here's a cool fact with whippoorwills. Whippoorwills actually um, will lay their eggs about 10 days before a full moon so that when the bird, the baby birds hatch, they actually can use the light of the full moon to find more food. But they have not adapted to being able to feed during the day. So they can't tell with a lot of lighting, they can't tell when it's, um, when it's dark and when it's light. So that severely affects their ability to forage to raise a family. Loss of habitat, okay? If animals are scared of light and they stay on the outskirts of light, all these street lights we have in parking lots, along roads, and in areas really just shrinks down their habitat. And it's very stressful for them to be exposed in the swath of light that's created by these huge lights that put off tremendous, tremendous areas of light. So you guys have probably seen this when you fly in and out of Charlotte. If you fly out at night, you can see the amount of light. I mean, it's getting worse and worse. The other one that it really kind of affects, which, which a lot of people don't think of, and this ties into why we're not seeing as many fireflies. Fireflies rely on darkness to be able to transmit their light to attract a mate. So if it's bright outside because of lights, their light signals are less effective. They're not able to find mates because they can't see them flashing. So that directly affects that. The other thing light does is it affects UV vision as well. You know, a lot of plants have adapted to, um, to be able to be seen in the UV spectrum. And lighting can affect them being able to see that. It's a new area that we're just discovering just how many animals are dependent upon the UV spectrum. And a lot of the different spectrums of light that we have out there for many different reasons actually affects that vision. A, a lot of people didn't realize that flying squirrels actually have a fluorescent coating on their belly. They fluoresce pink in UV light. Well, what happens if it's so bright outside that you can't see that? We don't quite know exactly why they fluoresce bubblegum pink on their belly, but nature doesn't do things for no reason, so there's got to be a reason. Lighting affects all of that, okay? So here's the big thing, guys, okay? What can you do? All right, how can you affect things? Well, first of all, become a wildlife steward. And when I say that, I don't mean become a Charlotte wildlife steward. I do mean that. But being a wildlife steward means being a steward of wildlife, being a caretaker of wildlife. If you decide to go and take the, the classes and the, the certification that Charlotte Wildlife Steward offers, do it for many reasons, but do it for the knowledge. Do it to learn more and do it to learn how you can channel your efforts to become a better wildlife steward and help toward the preservation of these species. First of all, in your yard, let's talk about what you can do in your yard. You know, make an effort to remove these non-native invasive species from your landscape. You know, crepe myrtles are beautiful and they put off beautiful flowers. They don't do squat for wildlife. They're terrible for wildlife. So, you know, Try looking at flowering native shrubs that produce not only flowers that pollinators are familiar with, but also that provide food for different wildlife, you know, for the birds, for the foxes that climb those trees. You know, try to try to plant these flowering shrubs. Uh, the other thing, too, uh, that's so important with planting different native plants is they have different bloom cycles. So, you know, you think about a crop, if you plant a crop of wildflowers and they're all the same wildflower, hey, they're great when they bloom for a week, but after that, they're done. So by planting a diversity of native plants in your yard, you're also creating a continuous blooming cycle that allows your pollinators to be able to come and have food all throughout the summer and spring and even the fall. 
Here's a big word for you. Shrink the size of your monotypic plant garden. I'm talking about your lawn, okay? I think we need to change our minds as to what looks good. You know, I used to work on an architecture review board in a, in a neighborhood I lived down on the coast. And boy, they had to have three quarters of the property had to be lawn. And I fought that and fought that and got it reduced to 50%. But a monotypic lawn does nothing, requires a lot of chemical upkeep that really does nothing but poison the environment around it. So really look at, if you want to have lawn, it's okay to have lawn, but shrink the size of your lawn. You know, plant more plants around it, reduce the amount of lawn that you have to care for because you know what? Hey, it's less money for you to have to deal with it. So if you plant, especially native grasses and things like that, again, plant native trees, you know, trees, flowers, shrubs, it'll attract your pollinators, birds, and other wildlife. Hey, and not only that, if you plant native plants, they're adapted for living in this environment. So it requires less resources. Okay. It requires less watering. Those are extremely important. Here's a big one, guys. And this is something that I think we don't spend enough time talking about. Use assessment-based pest management. Don't use these, this preventative and prophylactic treatment plan. Okay. It's March. I got to spray. It's spring. I got to spray. It's been a month. I got to spray. I spray quarterly. Why? Why are you spraying? If you don't know what's out there that you're spraying, you're basically spraying the illusion that something's out there for you to spray. Assessment-based pest management means you go out and you assess the pests you have. And if you don't have pests, you don't spray for them. Okay? So that's a one way to reduce pesticides. But anytime you spray pesticide, if you've got a specific pest, then try to do the most target-specific elimination method you can for those pests. Don't use broad spectrum pesticides, insecticides, or herbicides because you're absolutely destroying the invertebrates. You're destroying the microbes. You're destroying everything in the soil that helps your land around you function. Okay? So don't use those methods because they result in overuse. They pollute not only just our terrestrial environment, they make their way to our storm drains and eventually make their way to our waterways. And you know what? I'm just going to pick on Sugar Creek. Sugar Creek is a heck of a lot better than it used to be. But if anyone thinks it is a, a natural, wild, thriving ecosystem, you've got another thing coming because that creek suffers quite a bit from pollution, chemical, um, all kinds of things that happen in that. And it's a shame, and I know we're working toward making it better, and we should work toward making it better, but, you know, a lot of things appear to be nice and natural, and they're not. You know, our lawns, you may look at your dirt and go, boy, I tell you, I can grow anything in my dirt, but your dirt may not be healthy. Your dirt may, you may be missing all the microbes. You know, you may be missing all the nematodes. You may be missing all the grubs and stuff that help turn your lawn over, aerate your lawn, and aerate your soil and your garden. And we're just killing all that with pesticides. And we need to really curb the use of pesticides because it is not just affecting just our pollinators. It's affecting all of our life around us. And I would probably argue this is affecting you and I as well. If you've got water on your property, guys, how about use rain gardens to handle that water? Okay, use rain gardens to help create habitat for these invertebrates. Okay, use rain gardens to handle the water on your property. Don't let it run off across someone else's property. Collect all those pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers and dump them into our waterways. Okay, use rain gardens to allow your water to percolate vertically, not horizontally. And also, you can do some creative things to make some wonderful habitat uh, for the wildlife that's out there. Try to use natural fertilizers instead of chemicals, guys. You know, fertilizers washing off into our ponds is what causes our ponds to turn green and become, you know, basically just eaten up with algae. Eutrophification is a big thing that happens. And what do you do to get rid of the algae in your pond? You spray it with more chemicals. Minimize that fertilizer use. Minimize the overuse of fertilizer and try to use natural fertilizer instead of chemical. That's another thing that you can do that's extremely important. And boy, you guys are going to hate me for saying this. You're going to say, well, Marvin, he hates lawns and he doesn't like clean lawns, but you got me. I don't. I hate lawns and I hate 
Uh, the fact that we all just rake all of our leaves up, put them into a pile and put them at the curb and let them haul them off somewhere. When you rake your leaves, you remove nutrients from your soil that were naturally um, have, have basically adapted to the composting that naturally occurs with leaves on your lawn. Leaving the leaves allows your microbes, your nematodes, and all these soil bacteria to develop and help break down these items and, and basically enrich your soil. You know, it, and it's crazy because, again, people say they don't see um, lightning bugs and fireflies anymore. And, and a lot of it really has to do with the fact that we're removing all the leaf litter where they thrive, where they're bad. I was out in uh, in Woods Ferry over here near where I live, and I was recording screech owls. I was trying to get a good, clean call from a screech owl, and I looked on the ground, and there were five or six glowworms. They were the uh, basically the larva of the predaceous larva of the lightning bug, and they were glowing. My wife had never seen those before, and I showed her and said, this is what's living in the leaf litter that we leave without raking up. This is what turns into lightning bugs later on, and you know, and it made a believer out of her, and I'd love to make a believer out of you. I'm not saying you can't have a, a clean lawn. I'm just saying don't rake your leaves up, throw them to the curb, and then go buy mulch and put it around your trees. Use your leaves and let them naturally break down and provide mulch for you and provide natural nutrients to your soil. Save you some money, too. Also do it for knowledge. You know, there are alternatives and some of these alternatives are not gonna be received well from people that love to have a green lawn, but hey, turning your lawn into a natural prairie, you know, and unfortunately, yes, hey, some of you guys live in neighborhoods, you have covenants and restrictions, they don't allow that. But you know what? Covenants and restrictions can be changed, right? You can work toward doing that, but you know, do it in small steps. Okay. If you can't do your entire yard, hey, adopt a portion of your yard and try to make it as native and wildlife friendly as you can. Start small. Replace your, shrub, your shrubs with native shrubs. Get rid of those Burford hollies. Get rid of those euonymus and plant some native shrubs. Hey, here's something even better. Plant them with flowering or even fruit bearing shrubs. Okay. Not only do you have wonderful shrubs around you, you're providing food for wildlife, including those kids and grandkids that come over and can eat some of those blueberries that's growing in your backyard. It's kind of cool. Maybe just do your backyard, you know, if the covenants restrictions, you know, they want people to drive by and have that curb appeal, then you know what? <laughs> Put a fence up and, and make your, your backyard a, a wildlife habitat and leave the front yard to satisfy the, the box checkers, right? So, if you can do something, do your backyard and turn your, your backyard into a wildlife oasis. Hey, get together with your neighbors and see if you can adopt an area in your neighborhood to turn into a wildlife habitat. Charlotte Wildlife Stewards are very good at creating cert certified wildlife habitat, not just in your yards, but also in your neighborhoods. And they can kind of tell you and lead you down the right path, share resources and instruct you in the best ways to do that. One of the most extremely important things that they can do is provide a native plant planting list. What, what's available, right? It's, it's hard to tell you to plant native if you go to Lowe's and you can't buy native plants. And you know what? You used to not be able to find native plants at Lowe's, but pressure of people wanting to plant more natives, you're starting to see much more native landscaping at Lowe's, Home Depot, and other places. So you know what? You can make a difference. Take a small area of grass and turn it into a prairie. Use, use prairie species. Use some of that rubecchia. You, you know, plant some eupatoriums. Plant some sunflowers. But make, make it a beautiful little garden area. Plant some, you know, uh, butterfly weed, asclepias, to, to attract monarchs. But just take one area and plant that. Use native grasses. Use some flowers, uh, flowering plants, some wildflowers, things like that, and make a beautiful little section of your yard. Wildlife will appreciate it. So in terms of nuisance wildlife, this is that raccoon. And look, there are two animals that people love to hate. They love to hate crows and they love to hate raccoons. You know why? I secretly think it's because they outsmart us all the time. Raccoons, man, if you try to keep them out of a trash can, good luck. You know, they're, they're smart little critters and crows are pretty smart too. But so what can you do? So in order to keep from creating um, nuisance wildlife, you can do that by not allowing them to become a nuisance. 
Get good quality trash cans with tight fitting lids that lock. Okay. Don't feed your pets outside. Okay. And and I, I can't go without saying if you've got a cat that you let go outside and then bring them back inside, if you don't think that cat is hunting songbirds, you are sadly mistaken. Um, an outside cat is a predator. An inside cat can watch all the birds they want to out of the windows, but eventually they're going to kill a frog. They're going to kill a lizard. They're going to kill birds, things like that. Um, my sister is a cat lover. She has cats, and she says that um, Fluffy will never go outside and kill birds, and, and that's just that, that's wrong. If he's gone for six hours at a time, he's not out there playing you know, cribbage, I can tell you that. So, uh, so just always keep up with your pets, okay? But don't feed them outside and don't leave food for pets outside. If you want to discourage uh, wildlife from coming around in terms of like nuisance wildlife, there are some repellents you can use. There's a one called a scarecrow. There's a motion sensor sprinkler that works great. Motion sensor lighting can do it as well. Um, if you have a, a garden, try not to let things stay on your garden that long. Try to harvest daily. And if you feel like you need to protect it, put up some electric fencing to protect it. If you compost, use a commercial compost bin that actually seals and locks. Um, or use galvanized wire to fence off your, your compost bins. Don't throw out random scraps of bread and things like that to feed the birds because you're not just feeding birds. And if you like to feed birds, hey, Ernie, you're going to love this because you work, you work at the bird store, right? Use high quality bird seed. The better quality bird seed you've got, the more of the seed the birds eat, the less they kick on the ground. When you buy that cheap mixed seed that you get at places, probably 80% of it gets kicked off to the ground because the birds don't eat it. And guess what? We'll eat it. Uh, rats and mice and things like that. Um, so try to use high quality bird seed that gets eaten instead of getting kicked to the ground. If you have bird seed, store it inside. Don't leave it outside to let animals get into it. You can use selective tube feeders <clears throat> with fencing around the tubing themselves that will eliminate starlings being able to get to them, uh, English sparrows, etc. If you have bird houses, first and foremost, don't put your bird houses on the side of trees. That's bad, bad form. But if you got bird houses <clears throat> and it's been chewed out around it from squirrels and stuff, making that hole bigger actually makes it to where English sparrows can come in and get into those bird houses. Okay. Now, that's kind of a catch-22 as well, because if you've got a birdhouse mounted on the side of a tree and the hole's been gnawed out, you actually may be providing a nest box for a flying squirrel. And in that case, it's okay. But if you see English sparrows looking at the house, coming and going from your houses, especially if you live closer to the city, um, it's best to remove that house and put up one that actually has that inch and a quarter to inch and a half hole that actually excludes English sparrows but allows chickadees or bluebirds to be able to get into those nest boxes. The other thing I want you guys to please remember that if you're attracting wildlife to your yard with these plantings, and it's a great thing that you are, if you're feeding birds, please, please remember, it makes your yard more wildlife friendly, but it doesn't give you the ability to pick a la carte what wildlife comes to your yard, okay? You can't just feed birds and not feed squirrels. It, it just happens. You can't feed the cute birds and not feed the ugly birds, I heard someone say to me the other day, which I thought was funny. You're always going to attract things like squirrels. You may attract things like voles and stuff like that eating the seed. That, in turn, is going to attract hawks, owls, foxes, maybe a coyote. But all that is part of that food web that, that makes your yard a wildlife habitat and we can't pick and choose what comes okay unfortunately if you feed birds especially around charlotte you're going to find a pile of feathers and it's probably going to be a sharp shinned hawk but that is nature and that's a beautiful thing because you're creating a wildlife friendly yard and habitat and you should be happy about that and not sad so again one of the things we should really do is change our mind as to what a perfect lawn should look like and I will tell you I think the one in the middle is awesome and the one to the right is awesome okay not a monotypical lawn become a wildlife steward do it for the knowledge change your frame of mind as to what is a perfect lawn and as 
One of my idols, Steve Irwin said, if we save our wild places, yes, we ultimately save ourselves. So I hope you guys have enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I'm sure I probably generated lots of questions, um, probably hurt some feelings. I hope I didn't do that. And I hope I provided, provided some information for you. Um, if you like um, kind of these presentations and things, I'd like to introduce you to the podcast that my wife and I do. Uh, it's called Walking on the Wild Side. You can find it on all the major podcast platforms. Hey, what we do is we just explore nature and we try to instill in all of our listeners a curiosity uh, and foster an appreciation for just the amazing diversity of the flora and fauna found here, especially in North and South Carolina and the Southeast. Um, I do it with my wife. We have a lot of fun. Uh, we talk about different topics and things like that. We try to have fun. We're not heavy handed with it. We do get on a soapbox occasionally, um, but we just try to provide information, try to share facts that get people to thinking, and hopefully they can kind of develop that appreciation for wildlife that eventually will lead to us preserving and conserving the, the beautiful uh, biodiversity we have in the Southeast United States. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Ernie. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Marvin. I think we're going to let uh, Donna wrap it up and take some of these questions and um, we'll take it from there. So if anybody's got any questions now, you can type them into chat or uh, raise your hand and we'll try to get you on uh, online here for, um, for Marvin to answer your questions. Thanks. Ernie, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? All right. Well, Marvin, I was thinking as you were talking about um, all of these topics, one of the biggest challenge we have is to how best to educate developers and the people that run our city and county government leadership decision makers to foster change to help what you're talking about become more commonplace. That that is a challenge, um, especially when the housing market is is. is powerful as it is right now. And there's just such a dash toward just trying to provide housing, right? That's one of the big issues. Um, it's the large tracts of land that really affect us the most. You know, obviously we do lose a lot of our stuff, you know, acres at a time. There's no doubting about that. But when a developer comes in and purchases an incredibly large tract of land, there's requirements. And we really need to get to our governmental leaders because there are ways that we can actually require um, wildlife corridors. We can require green spaces in a percentage. And that pressure has to be put on our elected officials by us. That's what we have to do. We have to be the ones that educate them. And we have to be the ones that actually make them uncomfortable. You know, we can bring them to a town hall and talk to them about a town hall and let them be surrounded by people who vote for them and basically put them in a position to be able to hear us speak as well. You know, there are a lot of developers out there that are actually, you know, carrying the torch of sustainability. And, and it's a lot of times it's these smaller mid-level developments that are just into bulk, just producing tons of amount. We can't reach them because you can't argue with the dollar. And that's where it has to be, I think, with our elected officials, with our city's covenants and restrictions for new buildings, for new development. I mean, there's nothing, I'm, I'm a firm believer, there's nothing to say that when we have a lot of these apartment communities come in, they need to dedicate a certain amount of it to green space. They need to dedicate a certain amount of it to native plants in their landscaping. And they need to be you know, told how they handle their water and how they handle the development of that property from silt protection, getting into our, um, which, Charlotte has not done a very good job of runoff from developments getting into our storm trains. Um, but all that goes back to there may be laws on the book. They're just not getting enforced, but we've got to reach our government officials and we've got to change the rules and regulations that surround development. That's the way we're going to make the most impact, you know, and, and you can't say it now. You can't say that we can make an impact because you build a development and don't do anything that I just said, and you put a hundred houses on it, and they're going to sell a hundred houses in a week, you know, but if they're not allowed to develop without taking these things into consideration and doing them, because that's the way it's required to build in Mecklenburg County, 
they're not going to do it on their own. Some will, but most of them will not. And they pretty much need to be regulated. And I'm not a big government guy, but in this case, government needs to regulate a lot of this stuff that's going on with these developments and be able to make sure for all of us that we're developing sustainably. So. Yeah, I mean, you just gave us a lot of great information, you know, as to why, you know, why we need to do, do what we're doing and getting the word out is so much important. You know, that's so important. And that's one of the things we're trying. And um, I'll, I'll just put a plug in. Um, we were contacted by Subaru of South Charlotte because they bought some property that's going to need um, lots of work. It, it was had another type of business on it, so all that has to be removed. But it right. back this new this property backs up to a creek, and they want to have that as a wildlife habitat. Subaru is definitely on board with a lot of stuff that you you know that you're talking about. And and here's the thing. Yeah. The more press you give to what you're doing with Subaru, the more beneficial to Subaru it is and the more likely there is to do more of it. And there's not a more proud group of people that work for Subaru than the people there because they know Subaru is doing good stuff. And the fact that they're kind of aligning with you guys is fantastic because you guys do a lot and speak for Charlotte. And when you guys do that, you guys are perfectly aligned with Subaru. They're great. I do see a comment that Chris made about not many of us, uh, our government folks, which makes it tough to be more connected to the regulation side of the issues. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it comes down to, Chris, that's a great question, a great comment, too. Um, yes, join conservation groups, you know, vote, vote with, with that in mind, right? Make that an issue that gets discussed at a lot of these forums when they're coming up for re-election. Make it get on the on the topic. You know, in numbers, you guys can do that. One person may not be able to make a difference, which I think we can. But get together with your with your neighborhood organizations. Get together with Charlotte Stewards and, and Wildlife Stewards, and, and you guys force them to address some of these environmental issues. It's so easy now to push environmental issues aside for the more human-based and human-related issues because those are the hot topics. We need to make wildlife a hot topic, and I think that is a uh, that's a good question. Lobbying, absolutely. Um, you know what? Groups that come in, and again, I'm going to go back to Subaru, Donna. Um, Subaru would be one of those kind of groups that you could actually talk to before they come here, and they would actually go to the table and say, unless we do it this way, we're not coming. Uh, that's what we need more of. We need more of those advocates on the commercial side, and we need more advocacy in numbers. Okay? So good, good question, Chris. Brad's um, he just made a comment that working with HOA groups to implement improvements once developments are in place can also be a huge help. And absolutely. And we've actually had contact with a with a developer out by Waverly, and uh, they just recently found out about the, the habitat certification. And with um, kind of collaborating with Whole Foods because they've actually had some habitat planting done in some of the, the little planting areas around their store at Waverly. We're working with sure. them and this developer, we've, they're, um, there's now a pollinator garden in this neighborhood and they want to work with us going forward in any of their new developments. You know, I see someone say, is there any design plans for wildlife crossing say over 45? And, and you know what? They, in construction of these things, I mean, that's where it comes into play that there should be wildlife crossings over or under a lot of our major habitats and stuff. And, you know, once we get into requiring that um, as, a, as a government, as a, as a population, and it's hard, guys, but it starts with small efforts, drawing attention and building the snowball, right? Building a snowball that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, hey, man, it's hard to overlook that big snowball rolling down the street demanding for us to have more green. We've done a great job with Tree Charlotte and the Tree Canopy. You know, wildlife education should not only be educational, it should be entertaining and fun because you know what? There's a reason so many of us love wildlife and, and, and feel so strongly to want to protect it. We need to get back to that enthusiasm and appreciation for wildlife and people will do the right thing. Well, Marvin, thank you so much. I think we're going to go ahead and sign off now. Um, but again, we're, you know, if you haven't heard before, we're Charlotte Wildlife Stewards and you can find us on social media. You can find us at charlottewildlife.org 
and email us at charlottewildlifestewards at gmail.com. So thank you and good night. Awesome.